The American system, universal K-12 education, emerged about 100 years ago out of the progressive movement. And the goal was to give all children, regardless of their social class, a comprehensive education that would prepare them for an increasingly technically sophisticated world of work, and that is how people thought of it, even in 1910, or to go to college. So the goals were very much the same goals that people articulate today. And in many ways, that project was successful. <clears throat> Economists believe that the superior public education in the U.S. in that period contributed, helped drive America's leap to econo world economic leadership in the first part of this century. After the Second World War, many countries were envious of and imitated the American, American secondary education system. But now, 60 years later, many of those imitators have surpassed us. By many measures, our K-12 system has fallen into the second tier. And this, to me, is a critical national problem. We have, uh, in the UA, many graduate schools, and we get many, many talented students from abroad who are brilliant and well-trained. And graduate student schools across the U.S. and U.S. industry gain tremendous benefit from the steady inflow of skilled persons. But if we are to preserve the internal strength and resources that we need to endure as a great power, then we must improve our own public education system and do this for ourselves. And not only that, from a viewpoint of maintaining our economic leadership, but the public education system is an important part of what keeps this country together. It is the gateway for many students from disadvantaged backgrounds to move up. For many students, school is their first civic experience. It is the community that binds together children from all groups and all ethnicities and teaches them how to work together, know each other, and learn from each other. This is something that we cannot afford to lose. So if the public school system, and I'm here talking about the U.S., falls apart, or even if it fragments and self-segregates into a system of charter schools, I think we will have lost one of the critical things that the U.S. needs that supports its ideal of a class of society. <laughs> one of the things that the progressives had in mind in 1910 <clears throat> is that what ensures a class of society or gets us as close as possible is universal public education where everyone is being taught together. And so when we face this problem in Tucson, of course we are not trying to solve the national problem, but we are trying to solve that part of the national problem which we have some control over. And we, it's our responsibility here to do what we can do diligently to set an example for Tucson and for the rest of the state, and maybe if we were extremely lucky, even beyond the state. Yeah. That's what we are about. And to do that, there are two excuses that we have to get away from. The first, in other words, well, there are things that hold us back. The first excuse is the state doesn't give us enough money. Now, of course, that's true. The state is very obnoxious to us in many ways. But we have enough to do better than we are doing. And our responsibility in the TUSD board is to do as best we can with what we've got. So we can lobby the state for more. We can do what we can to elect better legislators. But in the final analysis, we cannot use that excuse. There are third world countries all over who have far fewer resources than we do to educate their children very well. And the second excuse we have to get away from is that families aren't what they used to be. We have more students from double earner households, from single parent households, from neighborhoods with gang problems, from families with substance abuse problems, all this stuff. And people say it's a different world and we can't do what we used to do. But that's an excuse. Down in Rose Elementary, Steve Trejo, whom I love, is running a school in a very low SES, socioeconomic status neighborhood, almost 100% Latino, 100 Latino population, and those kids are doing great. 
So we can do it. And anyone who says that we can't do it with the kids we've got, all that means is we have to work a little bit harder to exercise our responsibility. We have to do the job with what we've got, and we can't blame the families or the parents, and we can't blame the state. One thing that we need to do is rethink the school calendar. And this is something I've been pushing since I got on the board. And we've had maybe this much little progress on that. And we are inching along toward it. There are things in the calendar that don't make sense from the viewpoint of professional development, <laughs> don't make sense from the viewpoint of what families need, and don't do enough to create opportunities for students who need remedial or extra help to get that help. So we need to completely rethink what we're doing there with those three goals in mind. That's one thing. Another thing is we have to very much rethink the role of principals and how we treat principals. Because people ask me, they say, how come you have this school that's very good and this school two miles away that's not performing? And 80% of the difference in most cases is the principal of the school. There is nothing the central administration can do to substitute for a bad principal or to make a bad principal a good principal. So we have to rethink how we recruit, how we evaluate, how we compensate principals. They are the critical management of the system more than we are. That's the second thing. And the third thing is, what was my third thing? <laughs> I was going to mention, oh, we have to do, this is almost the most obvious thing. We have to get more money into the classroom. And this is just an old canard in the district, but I really believe it's true. We have higher administrative costs for students than anyone else in the state of our size. We have a smaller percentage money going to the classroom than anyone else in the state. And I think the board needs to set a threshold. Right now, we have 50.5% of our state funds go to the classroom as defined by the state. And I think we need to say, this needs to go up to 55. Uh, 55, for example, isn't that great, but at least it would bring us up to our peers. It would be a step. And so the board, while it can't drill down and micromanage every part of the district, I think needs to set a goal there. So let me address the social promotion now. Um, as, as some people here may know, I have been pushing the social promotion issue. I think that this is a serious problem in the district. I think the data show it's a serious problem. I'm not going to repeat all the arguments I've made. I may have had a column in a Tucson Weekly a couple weeks ago, but this is a serious systemic problem, and it's not helping kids, right? It's not helping kids when we pat them on the back and we push them on, and then they get the U of A, well, I get them, and they wipe out. We have 25 to 30 percent of kids wiping out, and they're nowhere near where they need to be, and any U of A professor can tell you that. And Employers all over town can say the same thing about the USB grants. Now, we're not helping the kids. Now, what Marion has said to me, she says, and Marion's very astute, she says, be careful about that issue. Well, actually, there's two reasons people say be careful, because parents will be scared about it, because it could be their kid. And secondly, you have to have supports in place to help kids do get over that bar that you're actually going to insist that they get over. And that's, of course, absolutely right. We're not trying to punish kids. We want to set a high bar, show kids the respect that comes with saying, we think you can get over it, and then set up the systems to help them do it. And that's, I think, making adjustments in the school calendar is actually a very part, important part of that. There are a lot of important parts. I think how we organize the calendar to create those opportunities for the bench is an important part of that. But right now, I don't think we respect kids by saying, we think that's all you can do. Kids are smart enough to figure that out. You know, if the expectations are low, the kids' expectations for themselves go down. And so and what we're doing now really doesn't help anybody except those of us on the board and the central administration who are so happy to see kids graduate and so happy to see our dropout rate go down. And then if they wipe out later, it's not our problem. I think now the problem, honestly, is that the board, even at a high level, has been generally unwilling to exercise policy leadership. And when it meets resistance from staff, and I'm, this is a general comment, not applying to a particular situation. When it meets resistance from staff, it tends to cave. And I, I view the district now as sort of where GM was in the mid-90s. 
where the situation is serious enough, and it is serious, and what makes it serious is the fact that our enrollment is dropping fast. That's what creates the potential crisis. Is that enrollment, we have to arrest the call of enrollment. And I think, like GM in the mid-90s, the board has to step up now and say, okay, for two or three years, we are going to exercise some leadership. And it doesn't mean really micromanaging, but we're going to say, we're going to look at principal's contracts. We're going to look at the school calendar. We insist that these things happen. 